All right, so today we are going to work on chapter nine. And chapter nine is all about estimating the value of a parameter. So this first section here, we're gonna work with proportions. We're gonna obtain a point estimate for the proportion. This is something that we've already done. We're then going to construct and interpret a confidence interval for the population proportion. And lastly, determine the sample size that is necessary for estimating a population proportion within a specified margin of error. Okay, so first up, obtaining a point estimate. A point estimate is the value of a statistic that estimates the value of a parameter, okay? So, meaning we are taking a sample and we get a statistic. As long as our sample is large enough, it should be close enough to represent the population value. So we're using a sample to estimate our population. So for example, the point estimate that we know when we're working with proportions, p hat, is x over n where X is the number of individuals in the sample with a specified characteristic, and N is the total in the sample size. So to work with a quick example here, the Gallup organization conducted a poll in which a simple random sample of 1,015 Americans 18 and older were asked, do you consider the amount of federal income tax you have to pay is too high? Of the 1,015 adult Americans surveyed, 458 said yes. Obtain a point estimate for the proportion of adult Americans 18 and older who believe the amount of federal income tax they pay is too high. So we are going to follow the process here of just creating the fraction, how many out of the total. So 458 out of 1,015 is 0.451. And basically what that means is we estimate the proportion of Americans 18 and older that believe the amount of federal income tax they have to pay is too high is equivalent to 0.451, okay? Or based on our survey, we have about 45% of Americans 18 and older that believe their federal income tax is too high. How do we use that? to then construct what is called a confidence interval for the population proportion. So in statistics, what we are going to do is we're going to conduct an inter or construct, sorry, an interval for a population parameter based on a guess along with a level of confidence. Now the guess is from our survey. So it's not just, I randomly pull a number out of thin air. I've conducted a survey and we get a point estimate. We have a proportion that we found from our survey. And that's in the middle here. And what's gonna happen is we then select a level of confidence. The smaller, here's a lower level of confidence. You can see um, it's not as spread apart versus a higher level of confidence means there's gonna be a little more spread around our guess to be able to take into account we wanna be more confident. So to think about it, a confidence interval is going to be a range of numbers. So think of like 20 to 30 is a range. And that range estimates where we expect this value to fall. A confidence interval for an unknown parameter consists of an interval of numbers based on a point estimate. And the level of confidence represents the expected proportion of intervals that will contain the parameter if a large number of different samples is obtained. So what that means, and we'll kind of explain that in a visual here a little bit later, is if I have a 95% confidence, what that means is if I were to pull a sample 100 times, I would expect 95 of the 100 to have the point a, a point estimate that is within my range. 
the for example here, just exactly what I said, a 95% level of confidence also implies an alpha of 0.05. And we'll get to that a little bit here. So we have two things here, 95% level of confidence and the remainder is in your alpha value implies that if 100 different confidence intervals were constructed, we would expect 95 of the intervals to contain the parameter and five not. That's again what we expect. What do we know from last chapter? Well, the shape of the distribution of all possible sample proportions is approximately normal, providing that when we do this calculation here, NP times one minus P, we get a value greater than or equal to 10, and that the sample size is no more than 5% of the population size, and that the data is obtained randomly, okay? Again, for this course, all of these things will be met. I'm not going to give you a problem that you will not be able to do. So when I check this, it will work. When I check this, it will work. Because our goal is to, can we perform the test versus just, does, does it work? The mean of the distribution of the sample proportion is mu p, which is equal to our population proportion. Our standard deviation was standard deviation of p hat, and that was found as the square root of p times 1 minus p all over n. Okay, so all of this is taking what we learned last chapter and carrying it a little further here. Because the description, distribution of the sample proportion is approximately normal, we know that 95% of all sample proportions will lie within 1.96 standard deviations of the population proportion, and that 2.5% of the sample proportions will lie in each tail. All right, so let me explain what this is saying here. We use the normal curve to estimate our population proportions. And when we do a 95% confidence interval, I want 95% to be between here, leaving 5% left over, of which there are two tails. 5% so split in half makes two and a half down here, two and a half up here. Okay, so next question then is where does this 1.96 come from? That comes from the normal calculator or also the normal table. So anytime I work with a confidence level of 95%, this is the Z score that represents 95% confidence interval. So it is a standard value. But like I said, you can always go back to the stat calculator normal. And then do between as an area of 0.95 and you'll get negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 as your critical values. All right, it is common to write confidence interval estimates for the population proportion as follows. The point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. Now, I again, I'm going to kind of show you step-by-step step here, kind of if you were to do all this by hand, and then show you how we use our technology to help us. We found on the previous slide that the margin of error for a 95% confidence is the value 1.96 times our standard deviation. That's going to determine the width of our interval. And then what happens is you add and subtract that from your point estimate. So let's illustrate what it means, maybe in another way, just to visualize, help make it a little more understanding. What we're going to do is we're going to simulate obtaining 200 different random samples of size 50 from a population that has a point estimate of 0.70. So 70% of the individuals believe something. On the next slide, it's going to show the values in groups of 100. A green interval is a 95% confidence interval that includes includes the population proportion of 0.70, and a red one does not. The red intervals that do not capture the population proportion have centers that are far away from 0.7. So what happens here on the next slide? We end up with 10 that did not include the proportion. 
as you can see here, the purple represents the tail part and the green represents the 95%. So anyone that is green has falls in that 0.70 range. This one here is too low. The purple is in the 0.70, so that the 0.70 is in the tail. This one here, way too large. You can see this one here, too large, too small, too large, too small, too large. And keep going, too large, too large, too large. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 out of 200 is 5%, which is 5%. We had a 95% confidence. 95% of our intervals were accurate, five were not, okay? We will never in statistics be able to prove 100% certainty. So this is why we have this here. The highest we will go is 99% confident, which leaves a little bit of buffer room for error. I hope that makes sense. I think it'll make a little more sense when we actually work through an example here. So the first interval, to miss the sample proportion that was too small results in an interval that that is too small to result in an interval that captures 0.7. The second one to miss was too large to capture 0.7. Calculating again, 190 out of 100 is the 95% confidence level. So again, representing that 95% of our samples captured our proportion that we estimated. A 95% level of confidence means that 95% of all possible samples result in a confidence intervals, including the parameter, and 5% do not. So if it was a 90% confidence level, we would expect 90 of them to contain the parameter, 10 not to. It was 99%, 99% should contain the parameter, and that 1% Caution though, confidence intervals do not imply probability, okay? A 95% confidence interval does not mean that there is a 95% probability that we contain this, okay? Probability describes the likelihood of undetermined events. So we cannot talk about probability when we have a parameter here. Just looking at an example of a coin, if I flip a coin and obtain a head, if I ask you to determine the probability that the flip resulted in head, it would be 0.5 because the outcome has already been determined. Instead, the probability is zero or one. Confidence intervals work the same way because the proportion or the mean are fixed quantities whose value is unknown we do not say that there is a 95% probability that the interval contains it. Here's the deal. Our value is an estimate, okay? So we can't talk about probability based on an estimate from a sample. We're gonna talk in terms of confidence. So biggest thing here, don't use any word of probability um, when you are describing a confidence interval. It is either yes, it works, or no, it doesn't. Whether a confidence interval contains the population parameter depends solely on the value of the sample statistic. It all depends on the sample that you draw, okay? If I pull this sample and my going to get a different sample proportion than a, a second sample that I draw, same size. They're going to be slightly different, which is why, again, we create that range. As long as it falls within that range, we are good. But we do know that there are extreme cases. There are things that are unusual that cause that parameter to be a little higher or a little lower, thus resulting in those few that do not contain the parameter. It's another visual. These are the ones that are included. These are the ones that are not in the outside. 
we are going to eventually talk about critical values here. Um, not a whole lot in this section, a little bit more when we get into chapter 10 and 11, because those are used when we compare a little later and if we're working with by hand. Because we are working with technology, you don't have to necessarily know the critical values here, but I am gonna show you on this table that anytime we're working with a level of confidence and a normal curve here with proportions, 90% confidence interval has a critical value of 1.645. A 95% has a critical value of 1.96. And 99% has a critical value of 2.575. Again, these are more for if you are going to do by hand, which we are not. So what we are gonna do is we are gonna start from the beginning, constructing the interval, and then interpreting it with our technology. We kind of talked about this already, but the way we want to discuss this is in terms of our confidence in the results. It's never going to be in terms of probability. So what we're going to state is we have a such and such percent level of confidence that the parameter that we're looking at lies between a lower and upper bound. So anytime we interpret our confidence interval, this is what we're gonna do. All right, so let's, let's follow the example here. At the beginning, we worked with that Gallup organization. They conducted the poll introduced up before um, that 45.1% of those surveyed considered the amount of federal tax in income tax they have to pay is too high. Gallup reported its survey method as follows. Results are based on telephone interviews with a random sample of 1,015 national adults aged 18 and older. For results based on the total sample of national adults, one can say with 95% confidence that the maximum margin of error is four percentage points. All right, so let's work through here. Our point estimate is 0.451. That comes from our sample. Our margin of error is 4%. 4% 4 is 0 0.04. Create the confidence interval. What you are going to do is you add the margin of error to the point estimate, and then you also subtract the margin of error from the estimate. So if I do that here, 0 0.451 minus 0 0.04 is 0 0.411. There's your lower bound. The upper bound, you take 0.451, 0.04 and get 0.491. Okay, so part one, constructing the interval. Part two is writing our sentence. So we are 95% confident that the, whatever we're looking at, proportion of Americans age 18 and older who believe the amount of federal income tax they pay is too high is between the lower bound and the upper bound. So we're 95% confident the proportions of Americans age 18 and older who believe they pay too much in federal income tax is somewhere between 0 0.411 and 0 0.491. What did we do? We had a sample, a sample of 1,015 people and found that 45.1% of them thought their taxes were too high. We used some math here to create an interval from 0 0.411 to 0 0.491. Our estimate for the population is somewhere between 41.1% and 49.1% of those 18 and older Americans thinking that their income tax is too high. Again, this is for hand. We're going to skip this. 
it's a long, messy formula here. What's happening though, is it's just showing you another way. You take your point estimate plus or minus the critical value that was in the table times your standard deviation. So this is what StatCrunch is gonna do for us really quickly. Again, we, will, we can verify that those two things happen, that NP times one minus P is greater than or equal to 10 and that our sample is less than 5%. So the second part here, the Z square root part is considered the margin of error. And the other part is the point estimate. So that's why sometimes you'll see point estimate plus or minus margin of error. Or in just cases, P at plus or minus E. In the parent team cell phone survey conducted by Princeton Survey Research Associates International, 800 randomly sampled 16 to 17 year olds live in the United, living in the United States were asked whether they have ever used their cell phone to text while driving. Of the 800 teenagers surveyed, 272 indicated that they text while driving. Obtain a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of 16 to 19 year olds who text while driving. Okay, these are what your problems are going to look like. And we are going to open stack crunch here. Okay, so to run this test, you are going to go to stat, proportion stats, and one sample. So we are working with proportions, which is why we go to proportion stats. And we only have one survey here, one survey of 800 people, okay? We are given the summary of information. So you're always given the option data or summary. Data is if they give you all the raw data, summary is what we have here. But we're gonna type in our number of successes. That was 272 out of 800. You can see there's two things we can test here. Hypothesis test is what we're going to do in chapter 10. Right now, we are doing a confidence interval, and we want to do 95%. So default sets to 95% here. And then I'm just going to click compute. What I look for is the lower limit and upper limit. So based on this, I have 0 0.307 as my lower limit and 0.373 as my upper limit. 0 0.307 to 0.373, 0.307, 0.373. So it asks you to just construct the interval. This is the interval. And I will show you that on the next slide here. The P hat is 0.34, that 272 out of 800, which we entered in StatCrunch. I did not verify here, but you can see that N times P hat times one minus P hat is in fact greater than or equal to 10. They said that will always work. So you can, you do have the option to just check. Yes, it works. And then here's the spit out from StatCrunch, which we just did. Same exact values, 0 0.307, 0 0.373. So what does that mean? Our lower bound is 0 0.307, upper bound is 0 0.373. We are 95% confident that the proportion of 16 to 17 year olds who text while driving is somewhere between 0 0.307 and 0 0.373. Based on this survey that was taken, roughly 30.7, somewhere between 30.7% and 37.3% of 16 to 17 year olds text while driving. That's what we found and we can be 95% confident in that result. Earlier, we stated 
that if we have a higher level of confidence, we will get a wider interval. So let's go to the previous problem. And instead of doing a 95% confidence interval, let's do a 99% confidence interval. So I will open back up my stat crunch. And I am going to click the options edit button. And I have the option then to change my interval here um, to 0.99. 99% is 0.99, and then just hit enter. Now, I go between uh, 0.297 and 0 0.383. 0 0.297 and 0 0.383. 0.97 is lower than 307, and the upper value is higher than the upper value we had on the other ones. So these are further spread apart. We got our lower and upper bounds. Uh, midpoint's still the same. Margin of error, if you wanted to know it. Margin of error for the 95% confidence interval was 0 0.033. The margin of error is how much the you went up and down by. The margin of error we got here, oops, sorry, I'm too far, is bigger because I have a bigger level of confidence. So anytime I increase my confidence interval or my confidence level, I increase the width of my confidence interval. So increasing the level of confidence increases the margin of error, which then makes a wider confidence interval. Know that larger sample sizes, of course, produce more precise estimates. So using that fact and that we use the sample size in calculating our margin of error, it would make sense that if we increase our sample size, we decrease the error, decreasing the margin of error, okay? So the more people you survey, the better results you're going to have, the more likely your results are accurate. That is what it is saying. What that will mean is that a larger sample size will result in a narrower confidence interval. Reason being, if I sample 20 people, I'm probably not gonna have a good estimate. There's gonna be a lot more leeway up and down from what those 20 people say versus if I were to sample 2,000 people. If I'm sampling 2,000 people at a time, I would expect my results to be a lot more accurate, meaning I don't need to have as big of a spread of an interval around my more accurate result. Based on a Pew Research poll, the proportion of parents who say children should be financially independent from their parents by age 22 or younger is 0.64. The survey was conducted on 9,834 parents, and the margin of error was reported at 0.015, with a 95% level of confidence. Determine and interpret the confidence interval for the proportion of parents who believe children should be of financially independent from their parents by the age of 22 or younger. Our point estimate is 0.64. The error is 0 0.015. So if they give me both of these, all I'm gonna do is add and subtract these results together. So 0.64 minus 0 0.015 is going to give me my lower limit. And my upper limit is 0.64 plus 0 0.015. So 
If you take 0.64 and subtract 0 0.015, you get 0 0.65. And then your upper limit, if you take 0.64 and add 0 0.015, you're gonna get 0.655. So we are 95% confident the proportion of parents who believe children should be financially independent by 22 or younger is between 6.25 and 0.655. As Harris Interactive Poll conducted during January 2008 found that 944 out of 1,748 adult Americans 18 and older who do not have a tattoo believe that individuals with tattoos are more rebellious. Obtain the point estimate for the proportion, construct the 99% interval, and interpret the results. All right, so 944 out of 1748. I'm just gonna put it on the side there so that I can see when I pull up my stack runs. Okay, so reminder, we go to stat, proportion stats, one sample, and I have a summary. 944 out of 17, 1748. I want to perform a confidence interval, 99%. Okay, so the first question said find the point estimate. It will do that here for you. The sample proportion is the point estimate, taking 944 divided by 1748. So my sample proportion is 0.54. So based on my sample, 54% of adult Americans 18 and older who don't have a tattoo believe that those with tattoos are more rebellious. So we then created our confidence interval and to estimate if I had access to the entire population, it should be somewhere between, I'm going to round it two places, 0.51 and 0.57. Okay, and I want you to look at this here. This is pretty easy to see. 0.54 to 0.51, that's the difference of three. One to four is three, and then four to seven is three. So you can see here that my point estimate is exactly in the middle of my confidence interval. Here's my sample value is 54%. This is where we expect the population value to fall. So we are... 99% confident, what it is we're looking at, um, adult Americans, 18 years or older, without tattoos, believe those with Tattoos, I'm totally misspelling tattoos, T-A-T-T-O-O-S, are more rebellious is between 0.51 and 0.55. Okay, so my sample estimates 54%. My confidence interval says that if I had access to the entire population, I would expect that value to be between 51 and 57%. So the last thing we have in this section is determining a sample size if we wanted to conduct a test. So 
again, I will show you by hand here with the formula, and then I will show you how we use StatCrunch to get us the result. So sample size can be found by this equation here. Taking the point estimate times one minus the point estimate times the quantity of the critical value over the error squared. So in order to find a sample size, you need three things. You need a point estimate. You need the critical value, which comes from the confidence level. And you need the error. So just remember that p hat, of course, is based off of n, which is what we're trying to find. So we have to be careful here. Sometimes we are given a previous p hat. Okay, so this is going to be based on some earlier studies data that we are going to use. Or if we do not have that, we are going to pick the largest possible value, which is half and half. The largest P, if we do not have anything, we're going to let B 0.5. So the choices. Option one, we have previous information. Or option two, we don't have any information and we are just going to let P represent 0.5, which is going to give me the largest possible sample size needed. So this graph here just shows how you're multiplying P times 1 minus P and what happens. And this is where the highest one is. Now, one thing to note. Normal rounding rules do not apply here. You will always round up to the next integer. It doesn't matter what is after the decimal, you will always round up. Because if you round down, you have not taken enough people. Formula here for uh, your sample proportion had you known it from a previous sample. Otherwise, we use 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 is 0. 0.25. Using my hand can get a little confusing because you're trying to remember, oh, which one am I using? We are going to use stat friends to help us determine the sample size. An economist wants to know if the proportion of U.S. population who commutes to work via carpooling is on the rise. What sample size should be obtained if the economist wants to estimate within two percentage points of the true proportion with 90% confidence if A, we're going to use a previous estimate of 10% from the American Consumer Survey, and then B is going to be if we do not have any prior information. We have a 90% confidence, 2% error, and 10% previous information. This is going to work through the hand way. I'm going to show you how to do it by uh, the calculator. Where you are going to go in StatCrunch here is still to stat, still to proportion stats, still to one sample. But what I'm going to go to down here is the width sample size. Okay, there are a few things that are going to be um, put up here. So the first thing you enter is your confidence level. The confidence level is 90%. The next thing you enter is your target proportion. That is if you have previous information, which we know to be 0.10. Oops. The last thing you enter is the width, okay? It stands for the entire width of the interval. 
So if your error is 2%, you're going to go up 2% and back 2% for a combined total width of 4%. Let me say that again. The width is the total spread of your confidence interval. So if our error is 2% up and 2% back, that combines to a width of 4%. 4% is 0 0.04. When I click enter, it will give me my sample size. So my sample size here is 609. We did 0.90, we did 0.10, and we did 0.04. That is 2% doubled. And we got 609 as our sample size. If you want to see by hand here, I will show you. The error is 0.02. And the Z critical value for 90%, according to the table we looked at, back some slides, is 1.645. So you could take 0.10 times 1 minus 0.10 times 1.645 over 0.02 quantity squared. Okay, Lots of math here. Lots of places in which you could make a mistake. This is why I don't have you calculate this by hand. The goal here is to get the answer to understand what happens. All right. So they ended up with 608.9, which will round up to 609, which is exactly the value we got back here. A whole lot faster, a whole lot less messy with StackCrunch. He wants us to not use any prior estimates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my calculator. No prior estimates means my proportion is 0.5. And I'm going to retype my width as 0.04. You'll see that sometimes it changes to a, a slightly different value. It's just rounding as close as it can. All right, so if I do not use any prior estimates, I need to now sample 1,691 people. So there's a big difference. 609 people using a prior estimate versus 1,691 people if I didn't have any prior information. So 0 0.90, 0 0.5, because there is no info. Enter 0.04 again, and we got 16, what did I say, 16.91? I'm going to double check that I said that correctly. 16.91, perfect. This one, uh, because things are rounded, they got six, uh, 16.91.3 and rounded up to 16.92. So calculating my hand rounded slightly different than what we got using StatCrunch. If you are doing these in the homework, one difference, it will allow that. So don't worry about the fact that this is one different. Um, it's just the fact that we use stack crunch versus a hand. And there was slightly different rounding. So we have to sample more than double what we would have if we didn't have information. All right. So I think I have two more examples. Uh, just one more example here. A social worker wants to know the proportion of U.S. population over 16 who provide elder care or unpaid care for someone with a condition related to aging to others. So probably if it's unpaid, it means you're taking care of uh, maybe a parent or a grandparent, someone in your family, because um, you're not getting paid for it. What size sample should be obtained if the social worker wants an estimate within 3% points and to be 95% confident if we first use a prior estimate of 0.16. Okay, we got 0.95, our prior estimate is 0.16. Our error is 3%. 3% doubled is 6%. So 0 0.06 is 6%. So 3% up. 3%, back 3% is a combined total of 
from my point estimate. I go back three, up three, total distance 6%, 6.06. Point nine five, point one six, and our estimated here is point oh six. If I have prior information, I need to sample five hundred and seventy four people. Okay, if I do not use any prior information, I'm going to default back to that 0.5 down here, keeping the rest the same. So this is now 0 0.5, 0.06. So instead here, I would now need to sample 1,068. Okay, so you can see how big of a difference it makes if you have prior information and if you don't. All right, so that is confidence intervals for proportions. Um, everything we're doing here is in StatCrunch under the stat proportion stats one sample. Whether you're using under the summary or if you're using uh, sample size with width. Okay, so goal is to take sample information, expand it to the population. What could we expect if we had access to the whole population? All right. So that is the end of this section. Next section we will go into means.